Chapter 19, Into the Black Down Under. We have to leave the old lady's place because, you never know, the cops might come knocking on each door. They're like bugs, my father says. They're not too smart, but there's lots of them and they keep at it. On the other side of the alley is this boarded up building. It used to be part of the Testaments until a fire burned it out. And my father decides we'll hide there until Iggy, Iggy gets a car for us. He reaches out and pulls off a big piece of plywood with one hand. The screechy noise the nail makes sounds like a cat fight. And the next thing, there's a real cat, a black one, that leaps out from behind the plywood. My father jumps so hard he yanks me to the ground and I bump my head. Dumb animal, he says. Get up now. That's just a scratch. L little bro blood never hurt a man. It doesn't hurt. And anyhow, I sort of like the taste of the salt in my mouth. It makes me feel awake. Get in there, he says. Then he's pulling me through this old burned out window and we're inside the building. Everything is black and wet and dripping except for, except for where snow has come down through the holes in the roof. Most of the inside walls are gone and you can see where the center beam was chewed by the fire. All the pipes and the wires are hanging down and everywhere underfoot is broken glass the color of smoke. I used to wonder exactly what hell looked like, he said. Now I know. He finds a place where the stairs go down into the basement, and he pulls away the boards and planks. You should feel right at home, he says, cooped up like you were in that cellar hole. It's so dark, he has to use a cigarette lighter, and the flame is so puny, you still can't see to the bottom of the stairs. You go first, he says. We can't have both of us on the same step. It might break. The steps are made of thick wood, but slick and punky soft where the water has been dripping all these years, and I can feel how it sags under my feet. There's a rail that's hard to grab with my hands tied, and the way he's holding up the lighter, you might as well keep your eyes closed because it's that dark, you can't see a thing. I slip and start to fall, and then he's pulling back on the rope, and I'm hanging there in the middle of the air with my feet skittering, and he's going, easy does it, boy. We'll take this one step at a time. Finally, we get to the bottom. There's a little slant of light coming through this narrow cellar window enough so we can feel our way around all the burned junk that's fallen through the floor. The accommodations could be better, he says. I'll grant you that. Soon as Iggy fixes things, we'll be on our way. He ties my feet back up and loops the rope tight around this old busted up boiler that's tipped over so you can't move or see what's behind me. Understand you can't be tr trusted quite yet, he says. Once we get on the road, things will be different. You'll get smarter. Every mile we put between us and this place. He rips a piece off my shirt and ties it in my mouth so I can't be shouting, he says, and wake up the neighborhood. He rubs his hand through my hair, real, real gentle, and I'm pretty sure there's a sweet smile on his face, although it's so dim he can't be sure. You just sit tight here a minute, he says. I have to see a man about a car. Then he's gliding away, and I hold myself still in case this is a trick, and he's really trying to sneak up on me to see if I can get my hands loose, which I can't. They're numb and bloated from the rope cutting into my wrists. And finally, I stop trying and just sit there, letting my eyes open up in the dark. I can barely make out that narrow window, hardly big enough so a cat could slip through. And under it is a big pile of coal slagged up against the foundation wall. Overhead, there's creaking with the weight of him moving around, trying to be light on his feet. I'm listening to him up there and trying to see out that little window when something moves against the light. I'm pretty sure there's a scratching sound coming from the window, except you can't always believe what you hear in the dark. Then whatever it is goes away. And I'm thinking it's probably a cat or maybe a dog sniffing around. Finally, I just keep still because the more I move, the tighter the rope gets. Next thing, I hear someone on the steps, these light feet trying to be real quiet. And then a flashlight comes on, and this woman's voice says, You there, kid? Loretta Lee. I can't say anything because of the gag. All I can do is sort of kick around a little, let her know where I am. You can tell by her shaky, thin voice she's scared of the dark. Kid, tell me that's you. Oh, Lord Jesus, what am I doing down here? Then the beam of flashlight is hitting me right in the eyes, and she's tripping over stuff trying to get to me. First thing she does is pull the gag off and I take a deep, deep breath that makes my lungs burn. It ain't right, she whispers, keeping her only own kid tied up. It ain't right. He ain't the man I thought I remembered, that's for sure. I want to say something, but I'm not sure what, and anyhow, my mouth is too dry. She put the flashlight on the floor, aiming up so she can try to untie the rope. 
man's a genius for knots, she says. I can feel how her hands are shaking as she's fumbling around. Also, I can hear the boards creaking overhead, but you can't be sure. It might just be the wind. Loretta goes, the plan is Iggy keeps him busy while I get you loose. Now, isn't that a good plan? There's enough cops up there to start a war. We'll be safe enough if we get out of this godforsaken place. Her hands are pulling at the rope, nervous and quick. But the knots just keep getting tighter. Finally, she gets the idea to cut the rope on the jagged edge of the boiler. I saw this in the movies once, she whispers. I forget what movie. She's working the rope against the sharp edge of that old boiler, and sure enough, it cuts through. Just the one cut won't do, though, when she has to do it twice more before my wrists get loose. And I can't really help much because my hands are all numb and swollen. Next thing is this piece around your ankles, she says. I sure can't carry you up out of here. You think you can walk I get this loose? Yes, ma'am, I say. That makes her giggle. Hi, ain't we polite all of a sudden, she says. There, that should about do it. My feet come loose and I try to stand up. I have to lean some of my weight on her. She goes, just a second, sugar, let me get this flashlight. She bends over for the flashlight. And then she's making this sound like something is caught in her throat. Two big hands are squeezing her neck. I see how my father is coming huge out of the dark. And he's got his hands around her throat, shoving her back. You ignorant creature, he says. I'll teach you to put your dirty hands on my son. Loretta can't say anything. She's sinking down to her knees and trying to pull his hands away from her neck. But it's useless. She can't stop him. He's squeezing her dead with his bare hands. And no one can stop him. No one.